I am Justin Taylor with Crossway Books, and today I have the privilege of sitting down with Professor Leland Riken of Wheaton College, English professor and author of the new book, The Legacy of the King James Bible, uh, being published in time for the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. So thanks, Dr. Riken, for taking a few minutes today. Glad to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about the story of how the King James Bible came to be? Yes, and it's an interesting story. Uh, the King James Bible was published 1611. It became the most influential book in the English-speaking world. Its point of origin was totally inauspicious. It happened at the Hampton Court Conference. James I called it when he was newly appointed as king in uh, response to Puritan requests to have a hearing. The Puritans were summarily dismissed in everything they requested in an attempt to salvage at least something at the last minute, they at least wanted a new English Bible. The king surprised people by acquiescing, but he did it in a moment of sneering put down. He said he had never seen the Bible well translated into English, so there's the whole English Bible tradition put down. But the worst of all was the Geneva Bible. Well, that was the Puritans' preferred Bible. But despite that inauspicious moment, when it came to the actual translation, everybody rose above partisan spirit. It was amazing. It's as though a kind of benediction fell on the King James Bible. So who were these men who were part of the translation committee? Well, they were the best Hebrew and Greek scholars of the day. They were not appointed because of religious partisanship. Now, it's true that they were all ordained in the Church of England, but within that, every facet of uh, the Church of England was represented. A fourth of the committee were people of Puritan uh, inclination. So the translators were the best of the best. So what can you tell us about the process of how the Bible was actually translated by these men? Well, it's a, a story of surprises also. To begin with, the translation committee consisted of 47 people. We on the ESV struggled with our unwieldy 12 men around the table, 47. They were divided into three main committees, three committees, but each of those subdivided into two. So we're talking about six translation committees. That's amazing. And then furthermore, they met in three different locations. Uh, the Jerusalem room just off the entrance to Westminster Abbey, Oxford University, Cambridge University. Somehow it all fell together. Uh, very much a group project and very thorough. Every one of those 47 translators would have read the entire manuscript. And how long did it take to put together from start to finish? Uh, it was six years in the making, but that's a little misleading because the first two years were spent um, haggling over who was going to pay for it. Hmm. The, the always strapped for money king or the bishop. We can assume that the individual scholars were busy in their studies already during those uh, first two years, let's say, from start to finish, six years. So it's published in 1611, and was it an immediate success? Did it make an immediate impact? It was not a sensation, but I'm going to part company with those who try to paint a picture of failure and say it was an immediate success. Um, in the first 33 years, the King James saw 182 editions, the Geneva Bible, a mere 17, the last Geneva Bible, and it was the bestseller that the King James had to supplant, was published 1616, five years after the King James. Really, you put everything together, the uh, King James Bible supplanted the Geneva Bible within half a century. So that's a success story. Yeah. Well, one of the things I love that you say in the book is that your purpose is not adulation per se, but it's to help us know the things that make the King James worth adulating. If yeah, the that, that's why I loved writing the book. I mean, it's a, it's a topic I believe in, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to write a propaganda piece, but I didn't feel I had to, and, right. but my enthusiasm shows through. And also you wanted to avoid being uh, dismissive of it and, oh, and putting it down. Oh, we live in a day of debunking, time. and I, you know, I wanted to certainly set the record straight in regard to that. So over three and a half centuries, it was the dominant Bible translation. How did that come to be? All right, I want to uh, explain the title, Authorized Version. Mm -hmm. It's the AV. Well, the King James was never officially authorized by either the king or by an ecclesiastical body. But I agree very much with a scholar who said it had an even better authorization. The people authorized it. Mm -hmm. 
So why did it take hold like that? Now, if I were to say an English Bible is best when its words are best, that might seem to trivialize it, but it's a defensible answer. When we open an English Bible, what do we see? We see words. Now, we have to explain what we mean by better words. Uh, words are not good if they're not accurate, and the King James was the most accurate Bible that had appeared up to that point. The words are beautiful. They are elevating. They are moving. Uh, they are winsome. So, in a sense, we are saying the words are better and that that's what won the readership. And is that what you mean when you write about the literary qualities? That's a of part a of it. That is a part of it. A literary Bible begins by being true to the nature of the Bible in its original. The Bible is a literary anthology. It gives us literary genres. Uh, literature always does things with language beyond ordinary spoken discourse. So the King James Bible preserves that quality of the original. Uh, its language is beautiful and uh, accurate and moving. Um, it does justice to the concreteness of the Bible's vocabulary. Um, it does justice to the, the beauty of the language. So maybe you could talk for just a minute about the impact in particular that the King James Bible had upon literature outside of the Bible. The, the, uh, the Bible is the single greatest source for English literature and American literature. Now, before I wrote this book, I just naively used whatever English Bible I used when I was talking about the Bible in English and American literature. Well, in writing this book, I got to asking what English Bible did the famous authors have? Well, the number of authors for whom the answer is something other than the King James Bible are statistically insignificant. I mean, just overwhelmingly and almost uniformly, it's the King James Bible that has been this pervasive influence. When I talked about the influence of the Bible on literature, I divided it into three chapters. We all know that the 17th century with John Donne and John Milton and John Bunyan were a great Christian, was a great Christian era, so there's nothing surprising there. We come to the 19th century, we have Nathaniel Hawthorne, Herman Melville, Charles Dickens, we would find it easy to believe they used the King James Bible. The surprise comes when we come to the 20th century with John Steinbeck, Ernest Hemingway, James Joyce, Robert Frost. The Bible is as constant a presence in modern literature as it was in the past, and it's the King James Bible that is used. So would it be fair to say if somebody is not familiar with the language of the King James Bible, they can't be culturally literate I would, I would agree with that. I found so interesting the comment of one of my colleagues at Wheaton College, who herself, I'm sure, was not raised on the King James. When she knew I was writing the book on the King James Bible, she observed to me that with the demise of the English Bible as the Bible of choice, her students at Wheaton College, Bible readers, just don't pick up on the biblical allusions. So she was linking the decline of biblical literacy with the decline of the King James Bible as the dominant Bible. I think people would, would at least have some vague notion of, of the way in which the King James Bible influenced literature. But you also talk in the book about the way in which it's influenced culture beyond literature. Maybe we could talk about that for a minute. Yes. Uh, some categories that I used in, in uh, my book were public discourse, presidential addresses, public orations, the courtroom. That was very interesting stuff. Education. For at least a century and maybe two, a lot of boys and girls learned to read via the King James Bible. Um, music, of course, visual art, literature that we talked about. One of my favorite bits of the puzzle uh, was an excursion to public inscriptions um, all over the place. In public places, we find the King James Bible. When, when I entered the, the uh, library at the University of Oregon during my years there, I could look up and see, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If you enter Harvard University to this day, right there at Harvard Gate is a Bible verse, <laughs> and so forth. How about the influence of the King James on other Bible translations in that a stream of translation philosophy? Alistair McGrath, a well-known British Christian, has written a book on the King James, and he made a really good point. The true heirs of the King James are those translators today who carry on the work of translation based on the principles of the King James. Well, the English Standard Version preeminently is that modern translation. 
everything I say about the King James Bible by way of accuracy, verbal equivalence as the uh, translation philosophy, the literary excellence of it, I can say equally of the English Standard Version. The preface to the ESV claims that it is in the lineage of the classic mainstream of English Bible translation, and then it also calls it the Tyndall Dash King James tradition. It's an absolutely accurate uh, claim for the ESV. So everything I say about the King James, I can say about the ESV. I would want to thank you for your work and hope that this 400th anniversary will help more and more people discover the King James Bible and the incredible rich legacy that it left. So Amen. Thank you for taking a few minutes today and I encourage readers at home to pick up a copy of the Legacy of the King James Bible being published by Crossway Books for the 400th anniversary of the King James.